Thank you, Jerry. Welcome to Jesus and Tim in Las Vegas. My name is Tim Behrens. I'm 72 and a half, and I'm still in my right mind, and that could be because I'm left-handed. But it's a joy to come your way every Saturday at this time and repeats during the week, thanks to KKVV. And uh, I like to hand out gospel tracts here in the secret suicide capital of the United States, Las Vegas, Nevada, where suicides are never reported in the media unless it's a murder-suicide. You say, why, why do you say that? Well, people need to know that these precious people that we come into contact with every day, we don't always know when people are going to commit suicide. Ray Comfort in his book, How to Battle Depression and Suicidal Thoughts, which is what I'm reading here uh, for the next few weeks with chapter four today, he writes, the most frightening warning sign that someone is considering suicide is that there often are no signs. Read this book, then pass it on to those you love. Ray Comfort is the best-selling author of over 80 books, that's 80 more than I've written, and the producer of several award-winning movies seen by millions. millions. This uh, book is a companion to Exit, a timely and powerful film about chronic depression and suicide. You can watch it freely, and his other movies on freely are fullyfreefilms.com. That's fully free films.com but please don't uh, watch it until I finish chapter four okay we're we're reading this book through I've, in 48 years of broadcasting I've never done that read through a book on the air but uh, well the Bible but you know would have a chapter here and a chapter there but uh, uh, today's broadcast will be uh, up on Jesus and Tim in Las Vegas on YouTube, my friend Brandon, he even has some old Tim and Al broadcasts. For those of you uh, who are a little older than Noah who remember Tim and Al on KBRT in Southern California and, and in St. Louis a number of years ago, he's been putting some of those old programs up. And uh, then, of course, Super Dave puts the newsletter together. The newsletter is being delayed a little bit this month, but uh, we'll have it out by the 1st of July. Dave always does a super job on that. That's why I call him Super Dave. He's not Super Dave Osborne, but uh, he does a great job. And you'll hear his family close the program today, as they do every week, with that wonderful song you haven't heard for a long time, Give Me Oil in My Lamp, Keep Me Burning. All right, let's, uh, let's continue on with Chapter 4. First of all, Ray writes on the back of the book, Your eye suddenly catches the frightening sight of a man perched on the ledge of San Francisco's Golden Gate Bridge, poised to jump. What do you say to him? In a sense, his life is in your hands. Such is the case when a caring bystander tries to convince a suicidal young man that his life has value and he has much more to live for in this moving fictional account. Will the bystander be able to address the man's true needs and talk him down? Would you? be able to offer a ray of hope and some comfort to someone without any includes helpful hope-filled sidebars from the world's best counselor this is published by genesis genesis publishing group again the title how to battle depression and suicidal thoughts and let's continue on with chapter four stay in the chair again i'm sorry i didn't know about your dad i said i'm trying to do the right thing his reaction wasn't the only thing making me more cautious. The fog was beginning to thin a little, and with the daylight, I was concerned that he might decide to go ahead and jump if someone spotted us. We were making some headway, but I didn't think he was ready to rejoin the land of the living just yet. Well, whatever you do, don't try to make me feel guilty about hurting loved ones by my suicide. I know that tactic. And well, I've thought about that he said as he leaned back a little, like he was starting to relax. Earlier I could see the tension in his jaw as though he were grinding his teeth. That suddenly stopped. I've thought about how my mom will react when she hears the news. Well, don't worry. Nobody's going to have to find my dead body hanging in the closet. No one will have to clean my brains off a wall. I've thought it out. What's going to kill me is the impact of the water. It'll be quick and clean. Sure, they'll have a nice funeral. There'll be a few tears shed, and some people may feel guilty, but they'll get over it. I also know that you want to get the suicidal person to talk. I've seen all that on TV, that it's healthy for me to let out my feelings and be distracted from what I'm planning to do. So I'll accommodate you. I'll talk. I'm going to tell you what's going on in my brain. It'll be a great case study for the experts. Finally, he was beginning to really open up about his thoughts, and for that I was grateful. I was happy to offer a listening ear. You know what's going on in my brain? Fear. 
pure terror, he said, emphatically sitting up straight again and looking me in the eye. It's so powerful it almost takes my breath away. Seriously, I can feel my heart beating in my chest. It's like there are two people living inside my head. No, I'm not schizophrenic, and I don't need to see a shrink. One of the voices is cold and calculating. It's pure logic, like Mr. Spock. It tells me that if I want to get out of this mess, if I want to rid myself of this pain and the feeling of hopelessness, this is the logical thing to do. Just jump. It says it'll be out of your hands. Gravity will take over, and in a second or two, you'll hit the water, and it'll be all over. Simple. But there's another part of me that's like a terrified child. That voice is quietly pleading with me, saying, What are you doing? You can't do this. You value your life. What if right after you jump, you suddenly realize you've made the worst mistake of your life? It'll be too late. Keep talking. I'm listening. And praying, I thought. I'd often heard that those who consider suicide don't really want to die. They just want to end their pain. It was a relief, in a sense, to see that was the case with this young man. His circumstances could be changed and the pains of death dealt with. As long as he was breathing, there was hope. He continued, I'm going to be honest with you. Mr. Spock is stronger than the child. I'm afraid he's going to win this battle. Deep down, I want you to talk me out of this. But then, what's going to happen after you're gone? And his voice comes back even stronger. It'll be back to square one. Hopelessness. Helplessness. I can't stand it anymore. Day after day, even when I'm talking, Spock is pulling me closer to the edge and whispering to me to jump. Please help me, he pleaded. Please say something that will help me. I can help you, not because I've been trained in psychology, but because I know exactly how you feel, I openly confessed. We had more in common than he suspected. I know the feeling of hopelessness. I know the feeling of a fear that is so strong it takes your breath away. So I ask you to do two things. Number one, and it's the most important uh, one at this moment, don't listen to Mr. Spock. He's not your friend. He's your enemy. Can you do that? I'll try. Second, I want you to trust me. By that I mean simply believe that my motives are pure in wanting to help you. I don't get paid for this. I'm almost as scared as you are, because in a sense your life is in my hands. If I say the wrong thing, or you take something the wrong way, or think that I don't care about you, you could just give up and let go. If you truly trust me, that won't happen. Can I trust you to do that? He took a deep breath and exhaled slowly. I can't promise anything, but I'll do my best to work with you. I don't want to die, but neither do I want to live. See, you've got a pretty big task. Don't I know it? Now it's my turn for a deep breath. But I'm going to give it everything I've got, because you may not believe it, but I love you and really do care about you, even though I don't know you. Just the fact that you're talking to me is a tremendous encouragement. I have hope, and I hope that I can pass that hope on to you. I know that you didn't want to tell me your name. Uh, you probably think that I'll call your family. I won't do that. Would you please do me the courtesy of giving it to me? There's an important reason for this, I explained. I'm going to say things that may seem offensive to you, and to be quite honest, if I can use your name, it'll make it easier for me. Please? John, he said quietly with a half nod. Okay, John, I smiled. I appreciate that. I'm going to do to you what a dentist does to his patients. He wants to save their teeth, so he's going to go over them one by one looking for decay. If he sees some, he's going to probe it. There's a reason for this. He wants to convince you that your teeth need to be repaired or you're going to lose them. So the temporary pain he causes is for your long-term benefit. I'm here because I care about your life. I think you're worth saving. I know you are, I stressed. You are much more than the animal that evolutionists say you are. You're not just a cosmic accident. You're a moral human being made in the image of God. I believe that you have great worth in the sight of your creator. But like the dentist, the only way I can convince you of that is to cause you some short-term pain. Here is where trust comes in. I want you to trust me for a moment while I probe. Just sit still and let this happen. The end result is worth it. John mustered as much enthusiasm as you would expect in a dental exam. Go ahead, Mr. Dentist. I'll stay in the chair. I'd like you to do more than stay in the chair. I'd like you to open your mouth wide and let me probe. By that I mean open your heart to me for a few moments and be really honest. Can you do that? 
I've already shared more with you than I have with anyone else in years, so yeah, no problem. Do you think you're a good person? Of course, I've made mistakes just like everyone else, but I'm basically good. In a sharp contrast to his previous demeanor, John was suddenly sounding more self-confident. How many lies have you told in your whole life? I'm not talking about telling your grandma that her hair is nice when you think it looks like an abandoned bird's nest. I'm talking about bold-faced lies. In my whole life, he shrugged, hundreds. What do you call somebody who's told hundreds of lies? A liar. You mentioned earlier that you stole things to feed your drug habit. What do you call somebody who steals, I asked. A thief. So what are you? A lying thief, John replied, but I still think I'm good at heart. Have you ever used God's name in vain? All the time. Jesus said whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Have you ever looked at a woman with lust? Like almost every male, his reply was emphatic, of course. Okay, John, this is where I need you to hold still. Don't flake on me. Please don't get mad, feel hurt, or listen to Mr. Spock. I'm going to tell you the truth about your teeth. Remember, I'm only doing this because I'm seeking your well-being. I said gently, I'm not judging you, but you've just told me that you're a lying, thieving, blasphemous, adulterate at heart. And that's only for the Ten Commandments, God's moral law. There are another six we haven't even looked at. So here's the big question. If God judges you by the Ten Commandments on the Day of Judgment, would you be innocent or guilty? I'll be guilty as charged, he readily admitted, if I get judged by that standard. Would you go to heaven or hell? Well, if I was judged by the Ten Commandments, I'd end up in hell for sure. Does that concern you? John shook his head. No, because I don't believe in hell. That doesn't make any difference. If a judge condemned a guilty man in the electric chair and the criminal said he didn't believe in the electric chair, it wouldn't change a thing. They would take him away and execute him despite his beliefs. The, Bible, the scriptures say more about hell than they do about heaven. They warn that God will have his day of justice. He's going to punish the evil that so concerned you earlier. Not only murderers and rapists, but also liars and thieves. I added, you wanted God to do something, and he's going to do it thoroughly. But he's holding off, waiting for you to repent and trust the Savior. He doesn't want you to end up in hell. So now you see that his inaction against evil actually has a legitimate purpose. It's for your good. I paused to see how he was taking this. I definitely didn't want him to jump off the chair or off the bridge. Please tell me if I'm talking too much or if you're quietly getting mad at me. I'll stop immediately if that's the case. How am I doing, John? Carry on. I can handle a prob probing. I continued, do you remember how you said that religion has caused more wars than anything else in history? Here are the historical facts. During the 20th century, more people were slaughtered in warfare than in all the preceding 19th centuries combined. Around 70 million people died in the first two world wars, neither of which were religious. They were political. Most of the wars fought in the 20th century were similar to the Vietnam and Korean wars. They were political in nature and had nothing to do with religion. So to say that religion has caused more wars in history than anything else is just not true. That being said, religion, meaning the man-made religious system, can't help anybody. It is merely trying to earn everlasting life by doing religious deeds, fasting, praying, facing Mecca, sitting on hard pews, living a good life, etc. None of these things will bribe God, the judge of the universe, to compromise eternal justice. The only thing that can save us from hell is the mercy of the judge. Can you understand how your, well, seeing your own sins changes things? I pressed John, whose head was now hanging down. No longer are you an innocent, sinless human being standing in judgment over Almighty God. Now you see yourself as an evil and justly condemned criminal pointing a holier-than-thou finger at a morally perfect judge. What are you going to do? If you judge from the bridge and die in your sins, your fate is sealed eternally. Damned means just that. There is no way out of hell. You may feel your life is hopeless now, but that can be changed. However, you won't have a hope in hell if you end up there. 
One second in hell will make you realize how much you should have valued everything you had on earth. Think about what you well, used to love and live for. I implored a cool drink to satisfy a raging thirst on the hot day. Or your favorite homemade foods like your mom used to make when you're really hungry. Or think of a song that brings back such great memories. It makes you smile. In hell, there will only be thirst with not a drop to quench it. Agonizing pain with no relief. And tormenting fear with no end. It's a place of terrifying punishment. So horrible it defies the imagination. And I desperately don't want you to go there. My dear friend was awfully quiet, and I hoped that he sensed my genuine concern for him, despite these harsh words. If this sort of talk is beginning to scare you, thank God that it is. Fear is not your enemy, John. In this case, it's your friend. Fear will keep your hand away from a flame and your feet from the edge of a thousand-foot cliff. And if your brain is doing what it should, Fear should make you pull back from the very thought of taking your precious life. It was God's incredible gift to you, and you didn't even bother to thank him. Instead, you ignored him and treated him with contempt. You even spit in his face by using his name as a cuss word. Again, is this getting too heavy for you? No, he answered somberly. Right now, there's a battle going on in your mind. We have a very real spiritual enemy who seeks to kill, steal, and destroy us. Satan, the enemy of your soul, wants you to jump. He'd like nothing more for you to seal your doom in hell. Who are you going to listen to, the devil who hates you, or God who's the lover of your soul? I paused to see John's reaction, and I silently prayed he was thinking seriously about these things. I continued, Do you remember how we talked about God's supposed inaction when it came to Jesus on the cross? Here's some information that will change your perspective. Jesus of Nazareth wasn't merely the Son of God. That title actually meant he was God Almighty in human form. Now, I'm a little nervous because I want to use that phrase your father used to use, so bear with me. This is what the Bible says. God was manifested in the flesh. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The Bible says God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. God created for himself a human body and filled that body as a hand fills a glove. Jesus was the express image of the invisible God. He was born as a human being, lived a morally perfect life, and suffered and died on the cross to take the punishment for the sin of the world. We broke God's law, the Ten Commandments, and Jesus paid our fine. If you're in court and are found guilty, if someone pays your fine, the judge can let you go and still be just. When Jesus was on the cross, he cried out, It is finished. In other words, the debt had been paid for our sin. Now God can let us go. He can dismiss our case. He can commute our death sentence and let us live forever because the fine was paid by another. So why did Jesus cry out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What you mentioned earlier, John asked. Psalm 22, written 800 years earlier, explains that when the sin of the world was laid upon Jesus, God, being holy, turned his back on sin. That's why Jesus cried out in torment. Such was his love for you and me. Then after Jesus had suffered for our sins, he rose from the dead and defeated our greatest enemy, death itself. The scriptures say that it was not possible that death could hold him. Through his resurrection, life overcame death. And now all who repent and trust in Jesus Christ alone as their Savior will receive forgiveness of sins and be granted the gift of eternal life. Do you think I'm speaking the truth? With a slight shrug, John answered honestly, I don't know. That's from How to Battle Depression and Suicidal Thoughts by Ray Comfort, Chapter 4. We'll continue with Chapter 5 next week. In the, in the chapter, they give some scripture verses that I'd like to share with you here. This is from uh, Call on God for Help. If you're suicidal, these are some good verses to listen to right now. 
I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Psalm 121, 1 and 2. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Psalm 91, 15 and 16. I sought the Lord, and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. Psalm 34, 4. In the day when I cried out, you answered me and made me bold with strength in my soul. Psalm 138, 3. From the end of the earth I will cry to you when my heart is overwhelmed. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Psalm 61, 2. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer went up to you into your holy temple. Jonah 2, 7. My soul waits silently for God alone, for my expectation is from Him. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. Psalm 62, 5 and 6. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Psalm 147, verse 3. And finally, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. From the book, How to Battle depression and suicidal thoughts it's published by genesis publishing group and uh, there's an accompanying movie along with it you can see it free on the internet just go to fully free films that's f-u-l-l-y free f-r-e-e -E, films f-i-l-m-s dot com and you can see exit the appeal of suicide when i hand out these movie gift cards and you can get these from livingwaters.com uh, I tell people here's six free movies, and one of them uh, deals with suicide. If you know anybody who's suicidal, have them watch Exit. It's a 38-minute documentary. I don't tell them that there's another movie that deals with homosexuality. I'm, uh, like I said before, I'm 72 and a half, and I've never, and I've, ra I've been raised in a church. I've never seen a Christian movie deal with homosexuality and it does it in such a great way there is a, a movie they got in this uh, fullyfreefilms.com dealing with evolution if your uh, if your child has had the revel uh, evol uh, religion of evolution shoved down their throat uh, have them watch this if they have a brain in their head they will no longer be an evolutionist after seeing evolution versus God uh, there's one that deals with abortion 180 movie the 180 movie again you can see all of these at fullyfreefilms.com but let me encourage you, uh, you, you know, if, you, if you've ever handed out tracks before, this is easy to do. When I'm in the, in, in the grocery store, I say to the people in front of me in line, this is free for everybody in front of me in line. Six free movies, not at the theater, but uh, online, fullyfreefilms.com. Do that, all right? Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, thanks so much for your prayers and support. If you'd like to help out, Tim Barron's P.O. Box 24091, Las Vegas, Nevada, 89101. Tim Barron's, B-E-R-E-N-D-S, Post Office Box 24091, Hillary. I mean, uh, uh, Las Vegas, Nevada, 89101. You're saying, how did Hillary get in there? I'm on Facebook. I'm handing a track to Hillary, quote, end quote. Okay, it looks like Hillary. And uh, uh, so I hope to see you there as well. Thank you so much for joining me. And remember, live for the Lord, bring home all A's. And remember, 1 Corinthians 15, 58. I'll let you look it up. God bless you, my friend. Bye-bye. <laughs>
for the Lord. Give me gas for my Lord, I pray. Hallelujah. Give me gas for my Lord. 